who are you? I am Ian Mackay. Ian Mackay, thank you for joining the Nardwar to Human Serviette radio show. I think actually for our fourth interview, although third official interview. Okay. Do you remember any of the other encounters that we had at all, Ian? Well, of course. I mean, I think the first time we met, I don't know if it was the show you put on for us at the hockey rink in Vancouver. That might have been the first time I met you. Although I might have met you, what year was that? Was that 90? That was 1991, and that's where you first met me. Okay, yeah. So then, is that before the IPU, International Pop Underground in Olympia? Yep, just before it. Right, so you came down for that as well. So I met you at that show. What was the name of that? that uh, was it West Van Hockey Arena? It was, it? it was at the North Van Rec Center. And it was North called, Van, that's it. And it, it was called uh, Moody Vo Moo Moo. I oh, yeah. actually didn't make it down to the pop explosion, the pop underground thing, because I was still recovering from the gig. And I guess in one of our last interviews, we discussed that gig, and I played yeah. you some footage from... Oh, yeah that gig yeah and then i guess over the years we would run into each other uh, mostly in olympia i guess um and then uh, we you, saw i saw you again in vancouver in the early 2000s uh, yes i saw you again at yo yo go go 1997 and my friend scott took a picture of me and you and cynthia talking i tried to get right. you to do a station id yes i remember that I mean, I think that over the years, you know, you and I have, um, I think you know, we know each other. I would say that we're friendly with each other. Friendly acquaintances. Can we go that far? Well, thank Shall you we? very much. Yeah. What do you remember yeah. of those other acquaintances? Because you kind of had said in the past there were like more interviews and conversations. You were kind of more into conversations and interviews. I think that you are probably, I think of you as somebody who has an enormous amount of interest and information in your mind, in your brain. Um, and when I have conversations with you that are off the record, you have a certain kind of, um, the way you speak is very measured. And, and then when you, the camera comes on or the microphone comes on, then you become a little more animated. And then you also, there's a certain kind of aggressiveness to your interview style, um, which I think is a, for plays as comedic effect to some degree, but um, it's also sort of like if I'm being interviewed by somebody and suddenly they just start yelling at me about very like obscure arcania, you know, about my life. I think, all right, this, you know, this is, it feels almost like an assault, but I don't know. You know, just, it's okay. I'm used to you. But we both love Uncle Faith's pizza. You love that picture from the space camp the last time that we talked together. The Uncle well, Faith. Did, yeah, did we talk about, at your interview, did we talk about that, that experience? We just took a photo, but we didn't actually talk about the experience of the actual pizza. You were on well, the then, cover? No, 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 no. joke. No. Right, well, here's what happened. I came up to do this talk, right, um, at a... Uh, the Spaceland thing in Vancouver. What was the event? It was um, at the Sh Chapel Arts, and it was called Space Camp. It was kind of like a gathering of people, like how to do an interview. Right. Like that, you right. talk a whole bunch of great stuff. Right. So by... I remember, so after the, I did, did the talk, I went upstairs to have, you know, they'd gotten some food, like a pizza. And I said, you know, I'm a, I've been, I'm a longtime vegan, you know, 30 some years now, 33 years or something. And so I said, please get me a pizza with no cheese on it. So a pizza was duly delivered upstairs and I looked at it and my impression was that somebody had carefully drawn a picture of me on the pizza box. And it was, it just, in my mind, I thought that was supposed to be me. And I thought someone did a drawing on the pizza bo box of me but it turned out it wasn't a drawing of me. It was of Uncle Fady. Is that how you pronounce him? I'm not sure, but we have an amazing photo of like me, you, and a pizza box together. Right. I sh I brought that. I brought one of those pizza boxes home because I was so. I. Was, it was such a weird. My brain just shifted. I thought in my mind that somebody had done a, a drawing of me, a really incredible drawing, and then I realized oh, that's just part of the art. And then I thought, why is my picture on this pizza box? 
I was so puzzled. And then someone says, it's not you. And it, once they said it, it was clearly not me. But there was just that moment. There was a moment in which I thought my brain just had locked in that that was supposed to be me. But it wasn't me. I don't know. How have you been affected, especially your new band at Discord, by this coronavirus? Because you were going to release a record. How has Discord been affected? You had mentioned to me a whole bunch of distributors, mail order, etc. How has it affected you? Me or the label or the band? The label. Just oh, okay. getting a record out. You know, a new band. Yeah. How is it getting out? Well, it just so happened, the timing of the record. I mean, this is a record we recorded a while ago, and we just are very slow moving. I mean, Joe and Amy and I have been playing together for five years in the basement. You know, for that's yeah, five solid years. We just played in the basement. It took us four years to do a show, and then another, you know, year and a half to actually get out and um, get this record done. Um, we're in, we were in no hurry. So it's not that big of a deal. It just, it just so happened that the release date was March 27th on the, um, 10th or 11th of March, things started getting a little bit like you started to get a sense that something, this, the virus was coming and there was, there was sort of rumblings. And I actually had a recording session with another band, uh, on the, um, 12th and uh, 13th and 14th. Um, and those are the days that it just suddenly went crazy down here. Like all the food hoarding and everyone was freaking out. I was in the studio the whole time, so I was fine. Um, and then, um, Sunday, the, um, 15th, I was just puzzling over like, you know, the situation. And I got to thinking, well, this is happening. Then all the shipping lanes are going to get really jammed up. So, if we're releasing a record, if it's supposed to be released on the 27th of March, we would stagger our release dates. I mean, we would shut our shipping to the different stores. So we ship to distributors and we ship to stores. So obviously distributors get the records first because they need time to turn it around. So do the stores. Then we would ship to West Coast stores. We're in Washington, D.C. Then uh, Mountain Time, Central Time, East Coast. The idea that all the stores get the records roughly the same time. So then they all put it out on the agreed upon date, which was March 27th. So that was the week, what we call ship week. So typically we would ship distributors on a Monday and then kind of each day we'd ship out things. And then the last on the beginning of the next week, we would ship out mail order. So um, I got in my mind that all the shipping lanes are going to get jammed with medical stuff. And I thought we better get this record out now and ship it to everybody now get it to them now before everything gets clogged so the next day we started to figure out how we could ship everything on the tuesday um but then that night it suddenly occurred to me if we ship these records they're going to arrive at distributors and stores that are closed so that morning i got up at five in the morning i thought uh oh so i I wrote to Brian, who worked with me here at Discord, and I said, call me when you wake up. So he did, and I said, we got to pull the plug. Because we knew at that point San Francisco was shutting down, and our main distributor there, Revolver, you know, they, they were going to be out of business. So though we could have continued to ship to our stores, it wouldn't have been fair to our distributors, right? Um, so we didn't ship to the stores. With that in mind, we could have shipped our mail order out, but that wouldn't have been fair to the store or the distributor. So we decided not to do that. And with that in mind, we could have posted it digitally, but we don't think that's fair to anybody. Um, since we didn't have any tours or shows planned around it, um, it's not that big of a deal, like in terms of like there's no time frame really for us. The biggest concern for me at the moment is that people pre ordered the record, a lot of them. I mean, right now here at Discord House, I have literally thousands of records packed up, ready to go, just waiting to be shipped. Um, but I think that it's the right thing to do in terms of the supporting independent stores and distributors. Um, and I hope that people have a sense of patience as we figure out what, what next to do. We're just, you know, it's a, it's a calamity, right? This is a worldwide calamity. Um, this is just a stupid record we're talking about, not the end of the world. 
And then there's so, a new band that you have, Corky, your brand new band. Soap and water will never get rid of. <laughs> the spot, my friend. That spot. Very yeah. topical. Soap and water. Corky. Yeah, yeah. Strange. Yeah, strange. Do you know and, the reference, by the Do you know the reference? Well, what is interesting is my mom, who has a Russian background, would always say, you aren't eating the crust. And she is Russian. And she would call the crust of the pizza a korchki. You would never have the korchki. So when I hear korchki, I think of korchki and I think of crust. Good. Um, you think of your mom, too. That's nice. But do you know the reference to the spot? No, I don't, actually. I just think of crust. <laughs> When I say soap and water will never get rid of that spot, do you know the spot? Do you understand that reference at all? Well, I kind of am more partial to your song, Have a Cup of Tea, because I can relate to that. You have, like, the re reference for Have a Cup of Tea. Have you heard my, that song? I saw a listing of it, and oh, yeah. I thought, what is your favorite tea? I love ginger peach tea. Are I you love a, ginger peach. Are you, are, you, are you evading my question right now? What, oh, I, exactly what is the spot no well i was pref i was thinking like i don't know the answer you probably know the oh, okay. answer all right i just wanted to, i was just curious um yeah cup of tea is good that's a nice song i like black tea i like green tea and black tea that's my pretty straight that's where i'm at just a, a it, simple tea this is i'm it, having some green tea here right now and thank you very much again for joining me, Nardwari Human Serviette, via Skype. I from the Discord office. Is this your office, your Discord office? That's the this is the office. The same one is Hold on. It is indeed. And here is Ian Mackay at the Discord off. Ah That's exactly. The same, the same one. And then this is two thousand. And now I'm sitting here in twenty twenty. With me, Nardware to Human Serviette. And you're sitting on a chair or a stool? Because in the evens, a lot of times you sat on a stool. Are there any more stools in Corky? No, I'm standing up in that, Bim. Where are all the stools? Did you ever sit on the stool you're sitting on right now? Well, this isn't a stool. This is an office chair that's high, a higher office chair. But no, I didn't use this chair. I used the drum stool. That's all. Simple. And Ian, and you're saying the evens, yeah. And Ian, you're speaking to me, Nardware to Human Serviette, doing an interview live from the Discord house. But you yourself have a collection of interviews, like from Mark Anderson. Can people hear those? What's the deal behind those? When um, Mark and Mark Jenkins did a, they did a book called Dance of Days, which is sort of a, or it's a history of the DC punk scene, um, and. Um, I actually haven't read the book because I'm a, I'm so such a central figure in it, and it just seemed uncomfortable to me to read about myself. So I tip, typically don't read books that are about me um, or involve me as a character. Uh, but Mark is a very good Mark Anderson, a very good friend of mine, and I knew that he had been interviewing people tirelessly for I mean well over a decade. Um, so at some point we were talking. This is maybe mm, 2000 and two 2003 somewhere around there and i asked mark where are all those cassettes and he said oh they're in, in a milk crate in my basement and i thought oh well shit you should let me have those and i'll digitize them all so this is before this is back when i could just uh, my digit my process of digitizing was just making cds um and i was really it was so um i worked for probably it's probably 400 interviews i don't know it's a lot of interviews i have probably have 400 hours of interviews with people um people can't hear them because they were done specifically for mark um and the book and they're not public they're not for public consumption um but they will end up at some point i'm sure as part of this the dc punk archive the, at the public library though i think they'll probably be under seal for a little while because a lot of those people are still alive and there's a lot of really personal information in there. They don't want, I don't think they would, they had not intended for people to hear.
it's incredible that you catalog everything, a real database, and you seem to have like an incredible archive at Discord of everything. In fact, you even have like a Nardwar letter that I wrote you. What's going on there with your archive? Well, over the years, I didn't really throw away my incoming letters. I have 35 years of punk correspondence, and for the last five or six years, I've been working with um, an archivist named Nicole Prokopenko, and we've been creating this pretty incredible collection. So this is uh, this is one of the boxes. I have you know dozens of these kind of boxes. This is Fugazi number three. So I have it broken into a various smaller like there's Fugazi, Meyer Threat, Discord, and um, Ian. So I can search by your name, and then I came across a couple things in this one box, which is box. Hold on, let me see if I can find it here. How many boxes are there? Like, does it fill a complete basement at the Discord house? Not a basement. It's in my. It's in the archive room upstairs. And it's amazing uh, that you kept all those correspondence that people sent you. Uh, what was yeah. your process in doing like somebody would send a letter and you would put it on a shelf or were you thinking from the very beginning i was going to store this away archively the process was from the very beginning is i would answer mail and if i found the letter interesting i would throw it in a box under my desk when the box got full i would close it up and put it upstairs and behind i have like a kind of a crawl space behind the wall and then i put another box under the desk and then over and over and over and over and then Probably, as I said, in around 2015 or so, Nicole came over and I showed her the stuff and she said, OK, so we just started pulling boxes out and I sat with her and went through every letter with her. So this is folder number 13. I don't know what. So you can see there's a few letters in there. Let's see what what you have to say. I don't know. Um, Nardwar to uh -huh. human serviette to Ian Mackay. Uh, Right, so there's undated, I'm afraid. Here's your letter. Um, it says, Ian Fugazi, exclamation point. It's Nardwar, the human serviette here from Vancouver, BC, Canada, saying, enclosed is a compilation LP for you. In fact, it's vinyl, CD, and 24-page booklet all in the same package. Yup, when you buy the vinyl LP, bonus CD is included, and it retails for under $10. Hope, I hope a lot, you like it. Arrow. Ian, if Fugazi comes to Vancouver again, I'd love to organize another all-ages gig. The university now has a 1,500-capacity hall available for rent, and I think I could get it. I'd like to organize another gig. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd love to organize another gig. Sorry for bugging you, but I'm bored. Keep on rocking in the free world. Nardwar. But that's amazing that you kept that. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I also have the record still. You did? Wow. In that same box? Is no, record I have the record. Oh. No, the oh. records in my record collection at home. Is there anything missing that you want from the archive? Like you said, you have a whole bunch of posters, etc., records. Is there anything that's kind of like the holy grail that you really want to get a hold of that you know that is out there, but it's hard to get a hold of? I'm not a collector, so I don't really. I'm not looking to complete a collection. Um, I'm an archivist. So what I'm what I deal with is the stuff that I have, you know, or that is in the collection. If people want to send me stuff, I'm happy to add it to the collection, but I'm not particularly looking for anything. There is one item that I had in my possession that has gone missing, that has driven me a little bonkers, which is in 1980, the Teen Idols went to Los Angeles on a Greyhound bus. Um, we played one show at Hong Kong Cafe, uh, Hong Kong Cafe. Then we took a bus to San Francisco and we played one show at Mabuhay Gardens. Um, this was 1980. It was the four members of the Teen Idols with two roadies, one of which was Henry Rollins. The other was Mark Sullivan. Um, we spent, I don't know, $3,000 between the six of us, you know, or something like that. We grossed, the tour grossed $26. It was a disaster in terms of like we, did, we certainly lost a lot of money. Nobody knew who we were. It was actually the first show the Teen Idols ever played outside of Washington, D.C. And we took a Greyhound bus for three days with just our guitars and a pair of drumsticks to do it. Um, while we were in L.A., we were, you know, we were huge fans of Black Flag, of course, and the Germs. Um, and so we were looking everywhere trying to find Darby. 
you know, we want to meet Darby Trash. And we looked for him in L.A. and we looked for him in San We asked around for San Francisco. Nobody knew where he was. A couple of weeks after we got home, a friend of mine sent me a flyer from San Francisco. Um, and it was a it was a flyer for a big festival, a punk festival. But on the back, Darby wrote a message to us saying, hey, Teen Waddles, sorry I missed you. <laughs> and it says, Mohicans rule because Henry at the time had a very low mohawk, like a not a big pointy one, but a little low mohawk. Um, and he wrote Mohicans rule, and it said Darby, and that was on my wall for years. But with the the inscription on the back of the flyer, I had the flyer showing. Can't find that flyer. That's that's driving me a little crazy, and I've searched high and low for it. Is it easy to find the Halifax hotel receipt? I asked you about a Halifax yeah. hotel receipt. This is some of the incredible stuff in your archive. Not many bands would keep their hotel receipt. What? Uh, this is a bit close. Oh, that's oh, that's amazing. Could you explain what people are seeing right there? The it's the Lakewood Hotel, Lake Lawn. So this is the Lake Lawn Motel in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, the date is what? July 26, 1998. Um, this was a, we played a show in Halifax, a great show. Um, we did a really nice tour. We went, I think we went to, um, we played in Fredericton and um, we came across from Quebec City and we came across and we ended up in Halifax. And then our next show was going to be in Portland, Maine. So we decided to take the ferry across from the bottom of um Nova Scotia. And so we played the show in Halifax and the next day we hung out and had a really nice time with the people there. And I think we hung out in these rocks on the West, on the East coast of, of, um, on the ocean there, just really beautiful. And then they headed back up to Halifax and we headed South down towards Yarmouth where the, which the ferry port, um, we got the uh, catamaran ferry, as I recall, and, um, the fast ferry, uh, so we got there in the evening. We thought we have night off, so we'll just get a nice hotel. And this was just a really simple old school hotel, and it was really memorable. I mean, I've stayed in a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hotels and motels over the years, um, but that one was was just sweet, and the people were very nice, and it was a really just a pleasant evening. And I I thought I, I have somewhere a photo of it, or maybe a postcard, but I can't I couldn't find that for you at the moment. I looked. Let me see. Made thing on the. No, it was just this. Thank you on the back. But um, but it, I kept it because it was just a real kind of old school hotel as opposed to most of them, which are just basically credit card receipts, you know. Um, and the price was $169. I think it was three rooms, maybe, if I remember correctly. Yes. Fugazi basically only traveled with two vans. How did you keep the receipt not from crumbling or getting crumpled up? Like, how do you keep it mint? It's incredible that you have the receipt, this random receipt. from How, how did you store all the stuff in the van? I was just curious. I kept in, I had a backpack. In my backpack, I kept a manila envelope and kept all my paperwork in there. I had folders. I walked around with those things. So I keep, I still keep receipts and stuff. I mean, I have, you know, I've, I just, it's just my nature. You know, I was the one who dealt with the money and the paperwork. So Fugazi, I have an enormous amount of documentation from that band. I mean, sadly, minor threat. I have some documentation, but boy, I wish I had kept more. And I think probably, you know, the teen idols, there's just a little bit minor threat. There was quite a bit more, Embrace never toured, so it didn't matter. Um, but I think that my experience of wishing that I had more really compelled me to document Fugazi's um, experiences or the Fugazi, just, you know, the the time we were touring. I just wanted to keep track of it. In fact, when Fugazi first started playing in 1987, I was keeping, I've always kept journals, or I had kept journals at the time, and I started a separate Fugazi journal, Um like I had my own journal, but then I kept another book with just a Fugazi journal. And every night we played a show, I would have an entry about the show, talking about what I remembered, or who was there, just anything, any experience whatsoever. And I kept it, it was pretty, I kept a solid record of the band until I think it was June of 88, so almost a year's worth. Um, and we'd done quite a few shows at that point. 
Uh, and I went down to see um, the Rollins Band at the 930 Club in here in D.C. And um, someone broke into my car and stole my backpack at that show. And uh, in my backpack was that journal. And it was a completely useless anybody. I mean, there was nothing in the backpack except a couple of journals and a VHS compilation tape that Tim Kerr from the Big Boys lent me. Um, and I spent, I don't know, two or three hours pulling up manhole covers and looking in sewers, going to the trash all around the downtown looking for it. Never found it. It's a shame. So, oh, that's terrible. Yeah. That's did life. You, did you document playing 242 Maine in Burlington? I mean, we played. Of course, I have you know, I have the record of what we who we played with. I mean, it's on the website. It's all there. The stuff that I have, generally speaking, and I have, you know, I would have probably the settlement sheet. Probably, I don't know. I'd have to you have to see. Um, and there's a couple of photos, not a lot of photos, but I remember the room really well. And um, I had, of course, no idea. Maybe at the time I was aware of the fact that the mayor's wife was involved with the the building, but the mayor was. Mayor Sanders, that didn't show the mayors everywhere. Who cares? You know, um, but it was a cool spot. I remember thinking that 242 Maine was really, um, it was very European. When you tour in Europe, you play a lot of social centers, which are, you know, basically venues that are not commercial venues, they're kind of state sponsored, government sponsored, and um, a little more freewheeling. So that was very European. 242 Main was one of the first ones here. Another one would be Gilman Street. That was another example of a some sort of a not really a commercial venue, but kind of, you know, out more connected to the the scene or the the you know the actual community. Minor Threat's last show was actually at an abandoned department store? Yeah. Yes. That that's an interesting venue, isn't it? Yeah, it was called the Landsberg Cultural Center. It was basically a vacant department store had been vacant for many many years uh and uh these fellows who were putting on shows um i think they started to do events there it's just a big hall um what was funny about that show is that we were playing the show was minor threat big boys and this band trouble funk who are a go-go band go-go is a, is a sort of in many ways, sort of a dominant music scene here in Washington in the black community. Um, and right, be- and- right, right behind you, Ian, you have some GoGo Forty Fives. I notice if you turn to your right, it says GoGo. There is Those actually are CDs. Those are CDs. Oh. Yeah, I have. I'm a. I've been a long time GoGo fan, and um, I have many, 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 many GoGo uh, records, CDs, and tapes. Um, but so Trouble Funk was a one of the earliest go-go bands and a band that we really, really loved. And I knew um, there was guys who had put on some punk shows and one of the guys was a go-go promoter. So we did a partnership, like a punk go-go show. Um, and it was really trouble funk show in many ways. It was their PA and their production. It, you know, they put the show together. When we got to the Landsberg, um, we were startled to discover that there was no stage because go-go bands don't use a stage because it's not about the band, it's about the dancing. So for Minor Threat, especially at that point, you know, we're, you know, we knew well over a thousand people were going to show up. Stage was pretty important. I think we cobbled together a stage out of a bunch of folding tables. It was really dicey. Um, and, and in fact, and Trouble Funk set up on the floor and wouldn't move their stuff. So we set up the folding tables in front of the, um, uh, the, their gear. And then the crowd surge was pushing the entire stage backwards into their gear. And the Trouble Funk guys were just freaking out. Um, but it all, all ended fine. And it was our last show as it turned out. What department was it in? It was in a department store. Like, was it in like housewares or sporting goods? Do you know, like, what was the area that it was in? It was more of the main hall. So when you go into a department store, there might be a mez. There's a mezzanine quite often, like a hall. Like you could see like a balcony, and there's like the main hall where maybe all of those departments you're talking about um, may have existed. But there was nothing there. There's no remnant of the department store. It was just a big empty room with a kind of a, as I recall, a bit of a balcony around it, but I don't actually, I'm not even sure if my memory serves me correct, but it was just a big empty hall. Nothing and in right, it. 
And right now, we are going to call Roger Allen because he has a couple questions. Are you still okay for time, Ian? Yes. Okay. We're going to call Roger right now. I'm going to add him to conversation. And we have Roger Allen on the screen. Hello, Roger. Hello. Thank Hi. you. <laughs> Thank you, Ian, for answering all Roger's questions. You've had mm -hmm. quite a few questions, haven't you, Roger? I, I have, I've had, but it's only because I'm interested. But yeah, I've had a lot of questions sporadically throughout the years. I never thought I would come face to face with the man I asked them to, but here I am. So it's hmm. virtual, face to, to, virtual <laughs> face to face. Virtual face to face. And Ian, believe it or not, Roger has been on the Nardward Human Serviette radio show like 53 times. 53 right. times. That's a lot. Yeah, that's that's true. I've been on Nardwar show over fifty three times, speaking just about my experiences with music and why I guess I feel they're important to me. You're long suffering. <laughs> oh, by the way, Nardwar, do you remember I was telling you about the Teen Idols show at the Hong Kong? Yes. Uh, some of the Los Angeles. This is a ticket. See, oh, me. Teen Idol. It's been spelled Teen Idols wrong. And Dirk Dick Dirksen didn't like your po photo, did he? He didn't like the photo. Right. Well, that's Matt Buhay Gardens. That's a different show. But yes, that's also true. And people can actually refer to that interview because I asked you about playing with the mentors, I think, in our first interview in 2001. So people can go back to that. And you had mentioned that Alduce carried an SVT cabinet all on his own. So people yeah. can explore more about in that's amazing that you have that and roger you were saying the plaza of nations gig that's really important to you isn't it yeah well w once again i'll just say you know ian i'm so used to hearing your voices on records it's throughout my life it's really cool to actually hear you to speak with you directly and uh thanks for taking the time sure um yeah like uh i'm holding up here the the ticket to the Plaza of Nations show from 1993, what I, which I actually sent to you maybe 15 years ago um, as you were documenting all the Fugazi live shows. And now this resides actually on the Discord website. Yes. I, I just saw this recently on there and I, I thought, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, it's basically rubble now, but Vancouver's Plaza of Nations was built for the World's Fair uh, Expo 86. And during Expo in the Plaza, there was a place where you could make a musical recording called Studio 86. People could bring in a recording of their own music and then sing to it in a professional studio for $11.95, and they would receive a mixed cassette of their song. It made me think if there were any sort of punk or hardcore bands in Vancouver that took advantage of that. And I was wondering, have you ever been in a situation where somebody tried to sell you a copy of the show that you just played? The only time that something like that at all, there we, we played it. Fugazi played a show in um, San Francisco. Um, I don't know, I'll have to think of the name of the venue, but um, it was a later a later show, and I didn't really know the promoter very well. The people we'd done shows with in the past had stopped doing gigs, and this person they um, did a five camera video shoot of us without asking us. Oh, yeah. um, they had kind of fixed cameras already set. Um, so then after we were home, he contacted me and he said, oh, I have this video of the show. And I said, oh, you know, that's nice. And, you know, and he said, you know, would you like a copy? And I said, yeah. And then I think he tried to charge me for it. So I told him to go fuck himself, you know, that's ridiculous. And then he wanted to sell it. He wanted to do a deal with us to just sell it. And I was just not, not going to happen. You know, it's not going to, it's just not, yeah, it was ridiculous. It was just a weird, it was very strange. I was, very occasionally, I think over the years, now that you mentioned, there have been people who have recorded our show and then later on offered, not necessarily to sell me a copy, but they wanted to sell it. Right. And then they were offering me, like they wanted if I wanted to be a partner in that. And then I'd say, well, give me a copy of it so I can see it. And they wouldn't give me a copy, which did, meant they didn't trust me, which meant, right. which confirmed my fact of not trusting them either. <laughs> When Roger has come to my show, doing a hardcore show, oftentimes he brings records. One of the records that he actually bought was a Buff Hall 45. And I think you have it there. What is the deal behind that? Because you told Roger that was a legitimate bootleg. 
a legitimate bootleg. Right. There was a, a German label called Lost and Found who are still in some form or other, they're still seem to be active. At some point, they contacted us about they wanted to do this bootleg of that particular show. Um, and I think maybe they'd already started doing I forgot. It was sort of like the horse is already out of the stable at that point. And um, so they sent us, they told us they'd do 1,000, I think, and they sent us 100 copies. And that was sort of like a tacit payment. Like we agreed to it because we accepted the, the 100 copies. We never even sold them. We just gave them away to people. Um, they didn't stop making them, though, or someone didn't stop making them. They continued to make them over the years. Um, that show was interesting, the Buff Hall show. That was a show Meyer Thrip played in Camden, New Jersey in 1982. Um, <clears throat> and before the show, I was standing out front um, with a bunch of kids or a kid skateboarding. It was a very tough neighborhood, Camden. It's just across the river from Philadelphia. Um, and there was a bunch of kids, you know, like a punk show. Kids are all hanging out out front. And this SSD control from Boston pulled up in a van. And I walked out to meet them. Al Burial, the guitar player, was driving the van. It was a brand new van. And it was the band was in there and all these like Boston crew guys, like all the and the friends of theirs were all hanging out. And there's probably 10 people in that van. And I walked out to talk to Al. I was standing by the front door. He had his window down. And um, it was a two-way street. And I heard a car engine kind of racing. And I looked to my left. And I saw a car about a block and a half away, and it was coming pretty fast towards us. So I yelled at the kids who were skateboarding in the street and said, watch out, this guy's coming really fast. So they ran out of the way, and I pressed myself up against the side of the van um, as close as I could to give this guy as wide a berth to get around me, you know, because there was plenty of room. It was a two-way street. Um, right before he got to us, he centered his car, and he hit the van head on. And I was standing right there. Um, I don't remember anything except for an enormous concussion and then an orange light going in a circle. Um, and then I woke up, I don't know how much longer, maybe, I don't know, a few minutes, I don't know. I was knocked out. I was probably 10 to 15 feet behind the van. My left shoe was 40 feet down the street. Um, the guys, people had stopped the car who had hit us Um but then they heard that I had been hit and people ran back up and then he drove off. Uh, the van was totaled. The people in the van were all messed up. They were, they you know, didn't have seatbelts. So they hit their foreheads against the windshield. And um, some kid said to me, how did you know what to do? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, it was right when the car hit, you grabbed the roof of the van and you jumped straight up in the air. So the front of the car went underneath you and your, I guess my foot hit the windshield and I flipped over the top of the car. Um, I went to the hospital. They said that, I, you know, they put some methylate on. I had a huge con contusion in the back of my head where I landed on my head. Um, and it was bleeding and they cleaned that up. And they looked, I broke a toe maybe. And I had a, one of my calves was messed up, but they said there was nothing else really to do. So we went back and then uh, I did the gig. I played yeah. the show. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's, the, yeah. that's the recording. At the actual hospital, you spent like $60. And I was thinking, how many, in dollar terms, in medical bills did you spend in minor threat? How much medical bills were spent? How much time in hospital total? Because there was a story that you told in one of our earlier interviews, I think in 2012 interview, about you playing Calgary and wanting to play Vancouver with the Dead Kennedys, but some of the band members got sick, but you didn't want to bring them to the hospital. So I was curious... What did the hospital bill total for a minor threat tap at? I think the only other time we ever had to deal with a hospital ever was it was in Winnipeg, actually. We'd done a show in Winnipeg. Um, as a matter of fact, why, here's the flyer for that show, Nardwar. <laughs> Amazing. Let's take a close look at that. Oh, who's on the uh, gig right there? Who's on the gig? The personality uh, crisis. Personality crisis and stretch marks. At the Monterey Pavilion. And That's that really cool. looks like a mint poster. Is that the actual poster? Because it's yeah. mint. How did yeah. you keep that so flat? How did you keep that so flat? 
That's true. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember. It was 1983. It's been a few years. Um, but that show, we played in Winnipeg. We had a good show. Um, but then Brian and uh, Jeff and I forgot, maybe one other person had been not feeling, maybe Rich Moore, our roadie, were not feeling well. And they wanted to go to the hospital when we were, got back to where we were staying. I think we were staying with a guy named Matt, maybe. Um, but um, we got back to the house and they really wanted to do the hospital. And I was uh, totally against it because hospitals in America are extremely expensive. Uh, and the idea of going to an emergency room seemed insane for a sore throat. Uh, and we, had, we got into a pretty serious argument. Uh, and then they mutinied. They took the van. They all went off to the hospital. And they came back a couple hours later. Um, and they were saying, we have tonsillitis. I hope you're happy. But I mean, tonsillitis <laughs> means sore throat. That's all it means. Um, the bill was only about $17. Thank you, less, Canada. Thank right, you, exactly. Canada. But yeah. it, didn't, it didn't stop us from having the drive from Winnipeg to Calgary was like a four hour screaming match about, you know, me trying to stop them from going to the hospital and, you know, me being angry at them for, you know, just went on and on. Then we got to Calgary. We did the show. We had to show the Dead Kennedys the next night in Vancouver. The Calgary show, we played a place called Ten Foot Henry's and uh, it was a late night. And if we were going to get to Vancouver, we'd have to leave pretty much right after the gig. Um, also, it had been snowing in the mountains. And it's about a 12-hour drive, maybe 14? How far is that yeah. drive? About 12 hours. And I think that the esprit de corps was rather low. And it was decided that it was just too insane for us to try to make this drive with people sick in the snow um, also, the other thing about it was it was a last minute addition, this show, and it would have kicked us all the way back to the West Coast and we'd have to make our way all the way back to I think our next show is in Minneapolis or something. So it just too bad. I really wish we could have done that show. It would have been great to play Vancouver. But uh, Brian was especially Brian was very sick um, and it just didn't seem like it was a good idea. So that's the way it goes. But, yeah, Canadian healthcare was cheap and they rubbed that in my face by the way <laughs> also speaking of skateboarding etc did jfa really challenge minor threat to his skate off yes it was ridiculous i think that they were brian the singer the singer is brian i think um those guys were real skateboarders i mean that's what they did minor threat were we were a punk band and some of us skated but i think that they maybe somebody in the band maybe it was a joke or maybe they just they just felt uh, somehow aggrieved that people referred to my Threat as a skate punk band when they felt like they were the skate punk band. But really, it's a crown that they were welcome to have. I didn't have any sense of comp there was no competition. I was the only person in Meyer Threat that really did time skateboarding. I mean, Henry and I in 1978. And no, I don't have the bus receipt. Um, I wish I did the bus ticket. I might have it somewhere, but I couldn't find it. I looked for it. Um, but Henry and I took a bus together. I was seven, I was 16 and he was 17 in 1978. And we took a bus together to California to go skateboarding um, and back. That's a lot of bus drive to go skating. Uh, so we took it very seriously skateboarding. Um, and then when I, but then when punk came along in 19, for me, late 78 and early 79, punk and skateboarding were kind of opposites. Like the people I knew who were punks thought skateboarding was ridiculous. And the people I knew who were skateboarders thought punks were just a bunch of pompous idiots. They didn't like punks at all. Um, so when I got into punk, I kind of just stopped with the skateboarding stuff in terms of going to parks. I found, and frankly, I found the skateboard jock mentality, not that appealing anyway. I didn't care for that. Um, so the punk thing was much more where I was at. Then in 1979, late 79 to 80, you know, that's when suddenly Steve Olson and Dwayne Peters and Tony Alva and all these people, they started, you know, showing up punk. And it was pretty incredible to see those two worlds kind of fuse. But when I first got into punk, skateboarding and punk were opposite. Of course, when I first got into punk, college and punk was opposite, too. Like people who you didn't go to college if you were a punk and you if you were in college, if you were in college, you didn't like punk. So. 
what happened with the skate off? Like GFA versus okay. Minor Threat. What happened? Like, did he do there tricks? No there was no skate off. <laughs> they cha- They just said they'd say they'd challenge it, but it was ridiculous. As I said, it's ridiculous. We weren't. I never even. We never even. I don't think we ever. I've never even seen those guys skate. I don't know anything about them. I mean, I know them. We played a couple of shows with them. I like their band, but I think that was more of a. I don't know. They just popping off. I don't know why. They can again. Ro- they. They can have the title. I don't care. Because, Roger, you were saying when you talked to Tim Kerr, JFA challenged the big boys to a yeah. skate off, too? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, they, that's sort of where they were at, you know. And they were the first band, I think, to have skateboarding on the cover. There's a picture of Michael, the bass player, doing on a half pipe. Yeah. It's a really beautiful photo. Great photo. Yeah. And I was just I think, talking to Glenn, Glenn right. Friedman about this the other day. I was just discussing this very thing that about bands that were skaters and and that was one of the first one i think code of honor has a skateboard on their cover too yeah um there's a few others yeah aggression that's right yep yeah and roger nardcore nardcore i'd like to think but not really because nardcore was like 83 um uh, speaking of, of skateboarding in the 90s fugazi played at vancouver's again plaza of nation and the plaza was built for expo 86 and during Expo, there was a, a world's skateboard contest. I believe it was the first one. And they, one of the events was at Vancouver's Sealand Bowls, which is the oldest skate park in Canada. Uh-huh. And, of, of course, Thrasher Skateboard Magazine was represented at that contest. Mm-hmm. And for me, as a kid, Thrasher really was a vehicle into learning about, of course, skateboarding, graphics, and music. Mm-hmm. And for me, music and skateboarding were inseparable. Right. And uh, Pusshead, who had an, a column in Thrasher, he created some incredible artwork. He started his own label, and he was mm-hmm. in a very intense band. Mm-hmm. Did Pusshead, was, was there any ever um, collaborations thought of maybe with Pusshead and Discord? Not particularly. Um, I mean, he did do, they, uh, Septic Death did a cover of, um, I think it was Out of Step. It's on a Japanese sampler. Do you have that? Um, I know. I but know anyway, the one. I don't have it. Um, but we met him. We first met uh, Pusshead in 1982. Meyer Threat was on tour. We went to Reno, and he came down, and we all skated together. He's a, we had a great time with him. Nice guy. At some point, he did send us some art. He thought maybe we might want to use some of his art for record cover. But, I mean, Jeff Nelson is our graphic guy and pretty strong graphics, you know, like Jeff Nelson. Yeah, sure. So we it was a, And we had our own aesthetic, but we appreciated um plus Ed's interest in you know what we were doing he's and as i said he was really active guy he's out of idaho he's in idaho he's a kid from idaho and he was really making something happen and in vancouver bc roger you mentioned the local scene skull skates kevin harris amazing he had one of his own boards didn't he yeah in uh board graphics again were really awesome during the 80s and in vancouver we had the skateboarder kevin harris who was sponsored by Paul peralta mm-hmm. and um he had uh, a VCJ uh, uh, graphic, which was right. one of the iconic graphics that Powell put out. It was a, a Mountie holding the skeleton of a beaver. Okay. Um, he also opened up the Richmond Skate Ranch. I have a newer uh, one of his boards here put out by Canada Skull Skates. Uh-huh. And he was a real inspiration because he created a scene, because he created a place where we could go skateboard way uh-huh. back in like the 80s. And I was mm-hmm. just curious, were there any skateboarders that were sort of inspiring to you, like from Washington in that area back then, or even maybe now? DC, Washington, DC skaters? Yeah, somebody in your area. When we first got into skateboarding, we kind of didn't know any other skateboarders. I mean, we just started, we were all riding bikes because we'd seen this movie called On Any, On Any Sunday, which is about motorcycles. A lot of guys jumping, right. you know, doing like dirt bike stuff. So we made our bikes into proto BMX bikes before BMX. Even we were just riding and doing jumps and making little tracks and berms and stuff like that. Um, it was, we enjoyed that. But then in about 1975, I guess, um, the urethane wheel started kind of getting around and we bought, uh, there was a board you could buy at a toy shop called a rolling star that had, it was a loose ball bearing, but it was a urethane wheel. And, really fun we just started riding and riding and skateboarding made a lot more sense for a city kid than dirt bike riding um 
so then we started getting more and more serious with skating as me and this friend of mine, John Hargadon. Um, and then at some point, um, we found out about this place out in Bethesda, Maryland, which is just north of Washington. They're called the, the Sunshine House. It was a, the surf shop. It was basically a place that sold surfboards and, you know, surfing clothes and shorts and stuff, but also had skateboards. So we started going there, which was exciting. That's when we first came across Skateboarder Magazine. Um, and Did that the was Sunshine the, House want to sponsor you? Not until they- later, much later, much later. Um but then we were skating, we were building a ramp, and that's, you know, Rollins, who at the time was Henry Garfield, um, he lived just down the street from us, and we'd been sort of on bad terms with him uh, through other stuff, And but he came by on a skateboard, and we saw him, and then he came back, he said, can I ride your ramp? And then we just became, you know, that's when Henry and I really locked down. I met Henry when I was 11, and he was 12, Um but I think really that skateboarding experience was really where we became best of friends. Uh, so there was a bunch of us in Glover Park, which is our neighborhood, they're all skateboarding. And then we met these other kids from Chevy Chase and Friendship Heights, which are other, other neighborhoods. And um, and those guys, uh, we formed a team called Team Sahara. And it was just a self-designated team. We had, We bought jerseys that were just black and gold mesh jerseys, nothing written on them, just... We just wanted an identifying mark. Mostly, we just wanted to be a street gang, essentially. Um, we started going to contests. Henry was a pretty good freestyler. I was never a good skater. I was an okay skater. Um, but John Hargadon and a few other people were pretty decent. And we would go do contests and freak out the other teams because we were unsponsored. Um, but we were very good friends with the Sunshine House people. And eventually, they actually offered to let us you know, give us a discount on stuff and so forth and so we've made a new shirt that has f and r which is finnegan and roberts which is the name of the people that own the shop so it's the team sahara logo with an f and r above it um but on that note let me get something hold on a second and we're speaking here to ian mckay with special guest roger allen hello roger hello nardwar we are speaking who are we speaking right now to we're speaking with Ian Mackay, who is just returning with something that he wants to show us. So one of the last things that, um, so those guys, they gave us discounts, but at some point they actually made boards. Um, they made skateboards and we got free boards from them. And this is one of the boards. Um, this actually, you can see has egg hunt stickers slathered uh-huh. on this side. Um, behind cool. here, you can see the top of the Anarchy A that, um, uh, biscuit from the big boys paint on the bottom of the board but on the other side is that's the Meyer threat oh. board yeah cool I've seen that that board somewhere that's right cool that's the board but this is <laughs> this is the uh this is my skateboard for years and years where did you bring that board like was there an abandoned police station was it stalag 19 or cell block 19 and cell abandoned block 19 cell What's... block 19 the idea behind that abandoned police station as a place for ramps, you know, to do skateboarding. That's amazing. Could you say anything about that? Uh, in Georgetown, in the neighbor, this neighborhood, Georgetown, on Volta Place, there was a substation. It was a small precinct, but they had shut it down. It was just an empty parking lot. So we just procured a bunch of wood and just started building ramps down there. Nobody said anything. So we just continued to do it until one day they just knocked them all down and it was, they built condos there, but it was a nice little spot. I knocked myself out there. Clean out. Roger, anything else to add to Ian Mackay? Uh, I no, I think I've asked all I want to ask for now. I think I'll email Ian in a couple of days. All right. (laughs) I'm just joking. All right. All right. Good to see you. Well, thanks so much, Roger. And do, 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 do. Do do. Ian, the Slicky Boys, 1976. One of my favorite bands, the guitarist of the Slicky Boys, ended up producing the Bad Brings? Yes, that's true. Kim Kane. Uh, he ended up producing the Bad Brains because Skip Groff from Yesterday and Today was too nervous to go in the studio with them. Um, the Bad Brains were a local DC band, and they really wanted to... Um, 
they want to do a record. So they knew that yesterday and, yesterday and today was doing limp records. So they went up there to talk to Skip Groff. Um, and they said, we want to go in the studio. And he knew he was interested in them. They were a very new band. Nobody had really seen them. But then he asked Kim, as I understand it, he asked Kim to go in the studio with them. And so Kim did. Um, and I'm not sure. I think it's just the Black Dot session, but it might have been the first session. There's two different inner ear sessions the Bad Brains did. They're great sessions. Um, and I think the Black Dots, it came out much later. It's, it's called the Black Dots um, on Caroline Records. But that was recorded in the summer of 1979, if I recall correctly. And I, I think Kim worked on that one, but he might have worked on the first one. Um, but the Slinky Boys, um, were you even, you couldn't possibly have known them in 1976. You just knew they were, that's when they started? I kind of liked them because they were lumped in with the Garage Revival, among other bands with the Fuzzstones, who had links to Tina Peel. Do you remember the right. band Tina yeah. Peel? Rep- but were you, yes, but were you aware of the Siggy Boys in 1976? No, I was in okay. the Cheap Trick and the Beatles at that okay, time. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, the Siggy Boys were a enormously important local band. Uh, they were one of the first bands that we would see regularly and always dance to them. They were just great, great people. Um, I the original singer was Martha Hull. I never saw them with her. Um, um, it was at that you know it was already at that point they had already moved to Mark Noon. Mark Noon, the singer, by the way, and you'll appreciate this, is I think a distant cousin of Peter Noon, of the Herman's Hermits. Oh, that's so, amazing! Yeah. Um, but Marshall and Kim, uh, Emery, Alexis on bass and Dan, uh, on the drums, they were just great people and really such a great band and, and super supportive of us. Um, there was a year in the early eighties where there's a local, um, award music award thing here called the whammies, which are sort of like the Grammys. Uh, and one year the Siki boys won best hardcore band. Uh, and they accepted it on behalf of all the punk bands like Minor Threat, who they said knew would never even come to the <laughs> to the award ceremony. They're really good people. This is a show here that the Siki, this is very early. This is Minor Threat um, and SOA, Henry's band, playing with the Slinky Boys. They asked us to open for them at DC Space. This is January 9th, 1981. So this would be probably our third show maybe maybe our fourth show um really supportive guys later we did a show with them um and the cramps this is the summer of 1980 sleeky boys cramps um tony perkins and the psychotics and the see teen idols and this wasn't idols and wasn't calvin at that gig calvin johnson he, was at that yes, gig he was sorry and i should clarify this was the summer before. This was the Teen Idols opening for the Slicky Boys. Yeah, I think Calvin was at that gig. Yes, yes and he you was. Because you had met Calvin at the Sunshine House. He wanted to get a T-shirt at the Sunshine House. That's he remembers that. My first recollection of Calvin was at a New Year's Eve party at Sharon Cheslow's house, New Year's Eve, nineteen eighty-one, and there was a guy there. At that time, people were wearing bandanas around their ankle, around their boots and stuff, because it was sort of the L.A. punk thing. It was a style. And this guy showed up with Converse in a pink bandana tied around his ankle. And we were like, who is this guy? It was Calvin Johnson. I mentioned him earlier, Tina Peel. What do you remember about the band Tina Peel featuring Deb and Rudy from the Fuzzstones? What do you remember about Tina Peel? I never saw them, but I always thought their song Knocking Down Guardrails, which is on the 30 Seconds Over DC compilation, is one of the greatest songs ever. It's a great song. I love the picks that Jeff had in MRR. What do you think about MRR being gone now? Maxim Rock and Roll is gone now. The punk Bible, MRR, is gone. Well, it was a hell of a run. You know, I mean, Tim Tim Yohannan was, um, he was a, true charismatic guy really interesting very funny pretty maddening at times you know i loved him but he was also drove me crazy uh and he really was iconic and he had his own he just did things his way uh when he died i sort of thought that would be the end of the fanzine but as it turned out other people 
really picked it up and ran with it for years and years. And I think it's great. And I think that the, um, you know, as a, I mean, you refer to it as a punk Bible. I, I, I would, I would say for me, Flipside was a more important fanzine for me. That doesn't mean it was more important for everybody, but for me, Flipside was the best fanzine. Um, but Maximum played a really central role in this sort of dialogue. I mean, obviously, this is at a time where people's communications were limited to either uh, letter writing or phone calls. So there was a Maximum was the fanzine that really embraced the national and international communities. Flip side, I think there was a brief period of time where they toyed with the idea that they would be a, sort of a national zine. But I think that they, Al and HUD, who ran Flip side, thought we just want to do an LA zine. Tim and Jeff Bale and Ruth uh, Schwartz and, and Biafra early on, I think they really felt like, let's make this a national fanzine. So in a way, the, conver the general conversation was always could be found in the letter section. If you looked in the letter section, you'd see the letter from, you know, a grousing letter from somebody in New York or Florida or whatever, and people were taking shots at each other. So I think that it was certainly had a really important role in the in the um, in the scene. In later years, it didn't have much to do with me. I didn't refer to it very often um, because I think that Johanna especially had a really orthodox view of what punk was. Um, whereas for me, punk is ever evolving, ever changing. So, uh, at some point he deigned us Fugazi, that is not punk, um, which is fine, but, uh, by his, but it just meant that we were punks, but not in his eyes. Uh, but we are still, as I said, still great friends right until his death. You know, we were, I love the guy. Winding up here with Ian Mackay, Ian, I was wondering, when you were over in the UK with Black Flag, what type of cheese did they feed you? That's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer to that question. It was a block of cheese, as I recall, like a small hunk of some kind of cheese. Uh, at that point, um, hunger was such a prevailing force. It didn't really matter what kind of cheese it was. I mean, we were starving. We had no food and very little money. I had some British pounds hidden in my shoe just in case I had to like really I was really desperate because they had already taken 50 pounds off of me to buy groceries and never pay me back for that. So I had to hide some money in my shoe because everybody was so desperate for food. Um, but they were giving us each day when I say they, by the way, I really mean Greg Ginn and Chuck Dukowski, who were sort of the de facto leaders of of Black Flag at the time. Um, and we were each each person in the party. It was um, Greg and Chuck, Des Kadeen on guitar, Henry Rollins on vocals, Robo on drums. Um, Mugger was a roadie and Spot the sound man and me. So there was eight of us. And each day we each received two rolls of bread, like bread rolls. Um, a hunk of cheese and an apple. Um, that was what we got each day to eat. And then after that, it was you had to fend for yourself. Ian, what other stuff did you find? Did I actually ask you to look for? Was there anything in the vaults of Discord? Just winding up with Ian Mackay, I asked Ian if he had some certain items, and you kindly thank you, Ian, for your time. Was it hard to find these items? It's not that hard to find. It's just... You have to have the time, right? You know, yeah, I mean, I can find, I didn't find more stuff on your list necessarily, but I just, just for instance, I'll pull out like, here's a, a stack of things. So for instance, here's that Lake Lawn ad. This is a Fugazi, this is a um, Scandinavian tour um, laminate. Uh, here's something from, this is, I think, 89. This is a, a benefit we did for a woman's shelter in um, uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. Let's see what else we have here. Um, a ticket for a show, the state theater. I mean, I have, you know, this is a luggage tag, Fugazi luggage tag, people. Did it work? Did the luggage tag work? Well, nothing ever got stolen, so we don't know. I assume it did. I mean, I have mountains of this sort of stuff. Let's see, see within this in this other. In this one, I have 
Springer from Black uh, from uh, SSD Control, his high school a photocopy of his high school yearbook picture. Um, now where was that stored all these years? Just in an envelope. I don't know. Here is this is a receipt from Yesterday and Today Records. And you can see I bought an advert single and a lurker single. This is nine, this date on here is March 13th, 1979. I bought an advert single for 95 cents, a lurker single for 95 cents, and I bought two poly bags and he charged me 10 cents. My total bill was $2.10. A good investment. Yeah. And here's another one from the same thing. This is an Ian Dury single, uh, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick. Uh, and the Eater single, probably Jeep, Jeep, um, I forgot which record it would be. And then Two Sleeves, this was $4.83. This is from the summer of 79. You were also working there at that time, were you? Uh, not yet. I didn't work there until 83. This is a, a ticket from the Georgetown Movie Theater. This is the movie theater that Henry and I all, and a bunch of us all worked at this movie theater for years. 1351 Wisconsin Avenue. 202-333-Valve is the phone number. Um, oh, here is a ticket from the DOA show, The Marble Bar, in 1981. Marble Bar was in Baltimore, Maryland. Were you at that gig then? Of course, because DOA were the greatest of all bands. And Ian, what exactly are we doing right now? What are you showing to people in case they're just joining us right now? What are you? This is from the Discord archives or your personal archives? No, this is just it's all the same thing. It's just basically in my it in my collection. I have the envelopes, and in envelopes, I have tons of little papers, and I've just haven't sorted these things out. So I just grabbed a whole envelope to show you some of the things that you might you ask you you're asking me for things I have so much stuff it's crazy so like i can't you know i just you know i can't really begin to um i don't know i'm just pulling stuff out you know that's what i can do if i had more time i could have gotten other stuff i mean i have like a teen idols this is a teen idols set list um this is from january 21st 1980 is that photocopied or is that the original? This is this is actually a photocopy. Uh, I think Jeff has the original. And is Jeff also into collecting too? Like he likes uniforms, doesn't he? He likes uniforms. Um, Jeff's a collector. I'm not a collector. That's it. See, I'm an archivist. There's a different. There's a difference. Um, oh. Will people be able to see some of this stuff eventually? You were saying it will end up in the library. Yeah, I should think so. Yeah, I think you know. There's an, an incredible cramps poster from the whiskey. Did you ever see the cramps with Kid Congo Powers? Because he was actually at your 50th birthday party. Yeah, um, I saw his first show in D.C. at the 930 Club, and it was amazing. He was great. And then he moved here with his husband, um, and we became, you know, we're good friends. Nice guy. And at your birthday party, your 50th, there were some seven-inch cakes. There were some cool cakes that you had. What was your 50th birthday party like? It was a surprise party, and there was 50 cakes. Um, but it was a complete surprise with 400 people. But it worked. I t was totally stunned by it. And Kid was there playing? Yeah, Kid actually did. Um, a bunch of different people played, like Brian Baker, Mary Timoney, Kid Congo, Ted, Ted Leo, and I think Brendan may have played. I mean, a lot of people were playing. Um, I can't remember the cast, but uh, but I think Kid did a cover of the song Peanut Butter, which is one of my favorite songs off of the Back from the Graves. They all did songs. like This was at your 50th birthday party. Yeah, it's called the band's called One Way Streets. We all love peanut butter. You should look it up. And it's that's amazing. from the Back from the Grave compilation. Part one, yeah. And that was at your 50th birthday party. 400 people at your birthday party. That's a lot of people. <laughs> that's it was a lot than... of people. Yeah, it was that's... crazy. And it was a complete surprise. It was also not on my birthday. It was about three weeks after my birthday. And you had no idea what was happening. No. Amy Farina, my wife, set the whole thing up. And she, she did a corker of a job. Just lastly, Ian, 
the wall behind you. Is there anything you want to point out? What exactly is on the wall behind you? I was curious. Oh, that's just all the, this is the Discord office. So at some point, Jeff started putting all the records on the wall. So you can see, that's just all the early Discord records. And, you know, so I think that, like, for instance, over here, you can see all the singles up top. You see the singles up there? Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So that's just, that's been the on the walls for, uh, I don't know, 30 years, 30, 32 years. I don't know. It's just the wallpaper here. And it got, we got as high as Discord number 35. So then we'd run out of space. Well, thank you very much, Ian. I really appreciate your time. Anything you want to say about your brand new band, Corky? No. Hopefully we'll get, we'll get this record out at some point. That's all. You know, we're just trying, we're trying to get the record out. Anything else you want to add to the people out there at all, Ian? <laughs> no. Thank you for uh, the question. I hope that it was edifying, entertaining, interesting, and um, yeah, I hope that it satisfied some of your curiosity, Nardwar. Our third official encounter. There was 2001, 2012, and now 2020 via Skype. We're still going. That's good. Well, well, thanks for much, Ian Mackay. Keep on rocking in the free world. world. And do do loot do. Hold. Yeah, very good.